I'm Brent Davis. And I'm Cindy Gaylord. We're part of the team that produces the Columbus Neighborhood Series. You can see some of us on the series opening. Well, there's you and there's me. Uh, we get asked a lot, who does the shows and how do the shows get made? We have five producers and two videographers on staff that work on the shows. It's lifeblood with steel and glass. Generally speaking, it takes about a year to complete one of these hour-long documentaries. And sometimes that surprises people because it takes so long, but there's a producer in charge of each episode, but we also kind of work in teams depending on the stories. We also get asked how we decide on the neighborhoods we cover. In the first phase of Columbus Neighborhoods, we covered six historic core neighborhoods. We knew downtown of Franklin would be a focus because of the bicentennial, and we worked our way out from there. To figure out the neighborhood boundaries, we look at historic maps, we see what neighborhood commissions and associations say, look at historical books, ask Columbus landmarks what they think, and talk to people in city governments. Uh, we have a historical advisor, Ed Lenz, who's been around forever. He'll tell us where he thinks a neighborhood begins and ends. Yeah, sometimes we fudge the boundaries if we think it's our only opportunity to, to get a particular story in. And then you have to figure out what to call the neighborhood. We called it South End. I've only ever heard South Side. I call it South End, but um, a lot of people call it South Side as well. South End. It was the end of Columbus. Columbus ended at the viaduct. That's where the streetcar ended. South End, that's right. See? I don't know. I always considered this kind of the east side. The, the story Figuring out what to call a neighborhood can be tougher end. than you think. You called it the South End. Once a producer knows the neighborhood they're responsible for, the research begins. We usually try to find out what's been written about our neighborhood. We make a lot of trips to libraries and bookstores and start reading. And we talk to lots of people as well. People tell us, you ought to talk to so-and-so. We'll get names from newspaper articles and chase them down, mostly phone calls at first and then follow up with meetings. Have you noticed that often the very first thing a producer does when they're assigned a neighborhood is visit every restaurant and tavern in the neighborhood? Restaurants are an important center of culture and commerce, Brent. Okay, give it a rest, Cindy. And from day one, we're looking for pictures, film, and video. I mean, it's TV. You've got to show something while you're talking about it. A lot of people tell wonderful stories, but we can't illustrate them. We don't have a show. And sometimes we leave out good stories because we don't have a way to illustrate them. Some of our best sources for images have come from the Columbus Metropolitan Library, from the Ohio Historical Society. They've been a great partner in all of those. Uh, WBNS has granted us access to their film archives, and that's been very helpful. And then we try to get to family albums, and that's really difficult. We don't know who has what until we sit down and talk to them and really go into the living room, sit down, and look at what they have. For our recent Southside documentary, we found there was a thriving Facebook site already going, and people from that neighborhood were sharing images, and we used those. My dad grew up in Old Oaks. He was an old-time family doctor. And in fact, one of the stories we told about a neighborhood doctor who was much beloved came right from memories people posted on the Facebook page. I guess Facebook is more than words with friends after all. We've also done storytelling sessions in the neighborhoods where we've invited people to tell their stories. We videotape these for research purposes and then put them on the web. After we've done the research and combed the libraries and books and photo collections, we've compiled a list of people we think can help tell the neighborhood story on camera. These shows include between 20 to 60 interviews. Most interviews take a couple of hours by the time we've set up, put up the lights, and roll tape. You do know we don't use tape anymore, don't you, Brent? Yes. <laughs> we record on cards, just like the most higher-end consumer cameras. In fact, the cameras we use now look like those 35 millimeter cameras everyone used to use. When we go out, it often looks like we're just snapping some pictures instead of shooting video. They're DSLRs, digital single lens reflex cameras. They make gorgeous pictures. We work very hard to make these interviews look good. Our vids are very particular in doing everything they can to make every frame look beautiful. We might talk to an interview for an hour or two, but these shows are really pieced together one sentence or phrase at a time. We also have to shoot B-roll or cutaways that we use to illustrate these documentaries. 
and we spend a lot of time trying to, to get just the right shot. One tool we've used is the time-lapse shot. Uh, and one of our videographers built a device that moves the cameras, the camera incrementally over a long period of time for a, a special effect. It, it's actually housed in a little lunchbox. <laughs> yes, it looks like he's always hungry when he goes on a shoot. <laughs> yeah. Another new tool we're using is a remote control hovercraft for aerial shots. It uses a camera, an HD camera, that's about the size of a pack of cards. And it's placed in a radio-controlled aircraft that our videographers have learned to operate. We can even use this device indoors for moving shots. And this is a piece of equipment anyone can buy. In fact, a lot of hobbyists are shooting video with these hovercraft. They're pretty easy to fly. People from the north settled in Worthington. We've also used reenactments to tell these stories. We've shot at Ohio Village, Slate Run Farm, and we've used local reenactors, authentic costumes. These, these people in central Ohio, there's a whole community that um, love history and they love to reenact certain periods of history. And they create their own costumes that are absolutely perfect, right down to the buttons and the kind of thread that is used. We use horses, we use um, period musicians as well that have period instruments, which is really neat if you think about it, that there's a lot of people in central Ohio that love history so much, they're gonna find their instrument, sometime make their own instrument, make their own costume, and um, just like performing. The edit booth is where the show really comes together. This is where the producer combines the snippets of all those interviews with the shots our videographers have captured. These shows take the better part of two months to edit, and I kind of have a rule of thumb. If I have a minute to maybe two minutes that I've edited in a day, I'm really happy. Uh, and a lot of people think that's uh, interesting that uh, you know it just takes so long to get this done. And the editing is where we add the narration. John Putnam, who's long been active in local theater, records the narration. I always tell him, once more with feeling, just because I can. And farther south on High Street, you could visit one of the nation's most famous farms, built from the profits of Dr. Samuel Hartman's elixir. He evidently had Music a is a big part of these documentaries. Each show might have nearly a hundred music cues, as they're called. Most of these come from a library of music we purchased. This is music that is written specifically for use in media. Two of our shows, Short North and University District, we featured local musicians who graciously allowed us to highlight their work in the series. And then we're going to make everything fit into an hour. That's 56 minutes and 46 seconds to be precise. So that requires that we have to leave out some things we'd really like to include. The proverbial cutting room floor. Absolutely. And there's more to Columbus Neighborhoods than the broadcast. There's a companion website, columbusneighborhoods.org, where we encourage people to join the discussion and share their stories and memories and photographs. There's also a link to lesson plans for the series at the website. We're really pleased that the Ohio Humanities Council provided funding to develop lesson plans that helps teachers use Columbus neighborhoods in the classroom. We visited a high school social studies class at Fort Hayes and saw how it works. Students immediately are interested in, in anything that is a part of their daily lives. So one of the biggest themes, for example, in American history that we emphasize in high school, American history, is industrialization and immigration. And all of the documentaries have portions of them that deal with industrialization and immigration. We didn't speak English at home. If you, if you didn't speak Hungarian, you didn't eat. <laughs> Students love the narrative, and I think that's the great thing that the neighborhoods documentaries provide for them. They see history now as really relevant to them, um, that it's not just about people who lived many years ago in faraway places, but it's even about the people that they know who are, who are part of living history in, in the community. The instructional part of Columbus Neighborhoods just won an award uh, given by public broadcasters and we're really pleased about that. One carriage that was a welcome sight was full of sausages. In well, I guess this wraps up our behind the scenes look at Columbus Neighborhoods. I hope seeing how Columbus Neighborhoods come together turned out better than seeing how Congress works. You know that story, it's like making sausage, you don't want to see the process.
I think our making of process is not as disagreeable as the political process these days. But that reminds me, you did show some sausage making in the German Village program. Well, if it's an essential part of the neighborhood story, we're going to include it in Columbus Neighborhoods.